Hello and welcome to Ruben Uncut. Today's topic, I'm going to be reacting to Ben Shapiro's reviews for the Dune movies. By the way, this is AI's interpretation of Ben Shapiro on Dune. I do want to share uh, some of the AI's other, other uh, ways they chose to represent this because I think they're kind of funny. As you can see here, I actually... Uh, in a strangely tasteful choice, I did choose the one that actually looks most like Ben Shapiro. Um, and I didn't... Turns out when you combine Ben Shapiro's face with Timothy Chalamet, they look kind of like Natalie Portman, if you're, if you're looking at this. Uh, so, so yeah, these, this one kind of makes him look cool. Uh, but uh, a lot of the... Um, his face got real effeminate when he ran it through the AI, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But uh, Ben Shapiro probably would, would not approve that AI is doing this to him. Although, to be fair, most of these kind of look like a cross between his face and like Timothy. You can kind of see the Timothy Chalamet in these two here, a little bit here, but, uh, but they look like Natalie Portman up here, also a little bit. Uh, uh, look more like an older lady. But we're not here for this. We're here to see what Ben Shapiro thought of Dune. Now, I am going to play both because they're only eight minutes apiece. Why not, you know, stretch it out a bit? All righty, today we are going to be reviewing Dune Part 1. First, this video is brought to you by Ring. Yeah, I don't give a shit about Ring. If there's an ad about that's about to happen for that, I'm going to edit over it real quick though i do feel like there's some context that's worth noting here for those not familiar with ben shapiro ben shapiro um previously reacted to his barbie uh review i would have reviewed to his oppenheimer review but i got tired and uh the video was like 48 minutes long it was the barbie combined with oppenheimer review but uh this should be interesting because dune as a book and a movie is very critical of a couple of different things that Ben Shapiro is kind of pro, which is it kind of presents religion as a conspiracy used to control us. Dune also, you know, not the best look for religion. Ben, of course, is very pro-religion. So we'll see what he thinks of these movies. It could be hilarious, or this could be hugely boring, uh, to be completely honest. Me and Ben Shapiro only agree on one thing, and it's that we love Batman v Superman. Um, although I highly suspect that his takes are terrible. I haven't actually watched the video. I just know that he tweeted that he liked it, but I assume there's a video for it. So let's jump into Dune. This is part one. I'm obviously more interested in what he says about part two, which is the much more damning of religion part. Well, let's see. So let's start off with the fact that this- That's worth noting. There's probably going to be spoilers for Dune here. This may be the best looking science fiction movie ever. So Denis Villeneuve, who's the director, he makes a great looking product, right? Blade Runner 2049 is a fantastic looking movie. And so is- a And also a critique of capitalism, you know, cause it's uh, cyberpunk. Uh, so far can't, uh, no lies found so far from Ben. And this movie is just spectacular looking. Like from beginning to end, every shot is a piece of art. It was sort of described by a lot of folks as David Lean style shots of the desert. That's correct. I mean, it does look like Lawrence of Arabia, which makes sense because the plot is kind of like Lawrence of Arabia, but the color scheme- I'm gonna say I've, I've not seen Lawrence of Arabia. No point of reference for those comments. Scheme is wonderful. Every shot is beautifully constructed. The special effects are great. You see every dollar on the screen. There's some movies where they cost a bajillion dollars and you're like, really? The, the sci-fi elements here look crappy. The computer generation looks awful. He is lit, okay. No, no, let's see what other movies he shows in this. Okay, we gotta talk about this. I'm sorry. But who is fucking editing this shit? <laughs> Who's your editor, Ben? You just showed you just showed CGI clips from like literally like 2000 what is it? 2003? You had the Matrix reloaded there and The Mummy 2? Like those movies are old as fuck right now, man. Even when even even when Dune Part 1 came out, those movies were over were like almost 10 years old. You, you could have picked more recent movies. Everything just looks first rate. It looks great. Uh, and, and so just 
on a pure aesthetic level, it's a beautiful movie to watch. The acting is excellent across the board. The score is overwrought. I like Hans Zimmer, but Hans Zimmer basically just takes the Blade Runner 2049 score and just plops it right in the center with some very high-pitched singing and some throat singing from like Vikings or something. I think that the score is overdone because the movie- All right, so this is, this is Ben's first L taking shots at Hans Zimmer's score. Hans Zimmer's scores are always great. Shut your whore mouth. Overdone because the movie is so weighty that you don't actually need to make the, the movie weightier by use of the score. I mean, it's a very dark movie. What? 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 Movie, just visually it's dark, but it is also, the story is, is very dark. So you don't need the music to do that much work and, and it's, it's a little bit obtrusive. Not a bad score. It's what? Ben. Ben, your complaint is that the music is totally coherent with the rest of the film. Ben, do you just want to have something negative to say here? And you're like, oh, I'll just I'll, I'll pick the music. Yeah. Like, what? Not a bad score. It's just not my favorite Hans Zimmer score. But bottom line is that it feels like a made up complaint. This feels like a made up complaint, Ben. Just as a piece of filmmaking, it's triumphant. Okay, so, so far, Ben likes the movie. Weird take on the soundtrack. Um, I, I would have to listen, I'd have to go rewatch all Hot Zimmer's movies to tell you which one is my favorite soundtrack, but like, uh, weird justification of why you, weird justification of your complaint about the, the soundtrack. You could have probably have just said, oh, it's Hans Zimmer, so it's good, but it's not my favorite. Like, but you tried to justify it with this really weird, well, the movie's totally dark and the story is dark. I don't know if I needed the music. Like, what did you want? What? Like, that makes it sound like you want the music to be like, la, 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 la. Like, what? Spoilers abound. Essentially, the plot of the movie goes like this. You have House Atreides, which is led by Oscar Isaac. His son is Timothy Chalamet. And his concubine, who he never married, is Rebecca Ferguson. Right there on one side. On the other side, you have House Harkonnen, which is kind of a stand-in for the Soviets, kind of. So these two... Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. I actually, maybe it is. Maybe Frank Herbert put the Soviets in there. Uh, it, the time period would be right. The time period would be accurate for that to be what it is. But like, in all honesty, it doesn't really read. Like, I don't, like, I don't see that. Like, I could buy it. I haven't read the book. So maybe there's more in there that makes them Soviet-like. But like, I feel like that's just the way Ben wants to see it. But like I said, haven't read the book. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe there's more to it in the book. And then it, then it just was like, it's not really relevant anymore. Two families are fighting over the planet Arrakis. The Harkonnen had, had dominance over the planet of Arrakis for some 80 years. And now... I called them space Nazis in mine because that's really more what they feel like to me. Like, they don't... I just, I don't know. Their behaviors, their actions, um, they read more... Uh, they don't read very communist. Like, even, like, the ways in which the Soviet Union was terrible don't really align with the actions of the Harkonnens. Like it's, I, I just don't see any clear parallels other than the fact that they're totalitarian. That planet has been taken away from them and handed to House Atreides by the emperor. So you never meet the empire. You, know, you don't know who the emperor is. What you do know is that he is afraid of House Atreides gaining support and then presumably taking power. So what he does, he sort of puts them on Arrakis in order to generate what is the most valuable commodity in the universe, uh, which is called spice. Okay, now spice is essentially the oil of the universe, right? It, it is this property that allows people to fly for interstellar periods of time. It is also a hallucinogen, uh, and it's holy to the people who live on Arrakis, who are known as the Fremen. The idea here is that House Harkonnen- I noticed he avoided the word drug. It's a drug, people. But he did say hallucinogen, so I'll give him that. Harkonnen is going to attack. The Empire is going to quietly support House Harkonnen and the Atreides are going to go down. So there's a lot of ins and outs there. You meet a lot of different characters. You meet the, the Fremen leaders, uh, one of whom is played by Javier Bardem, who's actually pretty terrific. Uh, you have Jason Momoa, who plays... Very casual compliment to one of, to one of uh, modern cinema's most celebrated actors. Plays 
sort of the military go-between who knows the Fremen and is able to act as a broker between the Fremen and House Atreides. The character's name is, is Duncan Idaho, which is, again, very sci-fi. Zendaya is in it, but doesn't say anything. She's just in a lot of sort of cutaway prophecy shots. Meanwhile, Oscar Isaac is trying to train his son to take over for him in case of his death. And his son, of course, is sort of hesitant. He has these visions of what the future is going to be like, where he's the leader of this giant jihad. Like, this is this huge rebellion against the empire, and he's seen as a holy figure. Throughout the entire film, by the way, he's being seen as a potential holy figure by the Fremen because there have been all these prophecies about an outsider who's going to come to the planet and is going to lead just such a rebellion. He has certain powers because his mom is essentially a witch. She belongs to an order called the Bene Gesserit, and she's taught her son a few of the tricks of the Bene Gesserit so he can use essentially what is the old Jedi. Is it Jezerit? Am I been mispronouncing it? Maybe. I don't know. I heard it in the movie. I blame their diction. I trick on people. He can speak to them and make them do what he wants to do by setting his voice to a certain timber. He kind of fulfills the basic notion of what this messianic figure on the planet is supposed to be. Oscar Isaac's plan is that he's going to get to the planet and he's going to make common cause with the Fremen. They're going to allow him to mine the spice that they need. And he's going to basically leave them alone. And there's a pretty intense scene where there is a sand trawler that is picking up the spice and, and mining the spice, and it's attacked by one of the sandworms. And it's a pretty amazing scene. It's an amazing looking scene. House Harkonnen ends up attacking Arrakis, the giant, pretty spectacular looking battle ensues. The House of Atreides goes down. Oscar Isaac is captured. He is killed, but not before he poisons the head of House Harkonnen with poison that is hidden in his tooth. And meanwhile, Timothy Chalamet escapes to the desert with his mom. And he has this vision in the desert, and he is very upset about this because his mom made him a freak, and he doesn't really want to take up this mantle. But he realizes that they have to survive, and so they wander out into the desert, and they are trying to find the Fremen. Okay. All right. This is Ben Sh Whatever Ben Shapiro didn't like about the movie is about to be explained now. This should be interesting. The biggest issue with the movie is that it ends kind of randomly. Now, we knew because it was called Dune Part 1 that there will be a Part 2. And so some people are saying, well, you know, so what? It cut off in the middle. Like, why is that a big deal? The answer is that it's not a big deal that it cut off in the middle. The problem is that it cut off in the middle of a story beat, which is a very weird place to actually cut off the movie. So it feels strangely 15 minutes too long and two and a half hours too short. If you're going to do the whole story, it's got to be probably five or six hours. It would have made a great miniseries. If you're going to cut off the movie in the middle, then really they should have cut off the movie maybe 20 minutes sooner. He starts to meet with the Fremen. They find the Fremen. They have this interaction where he has to beat one of the Fremen in a knife fight. And then the movie ends, right? After he meets Zendaya. The weird part about that is that should be the beginning of the second movie, right? My problem is not that there's a break in the movie. There's a break in Fellowship of the Ring also. The difference is that Fellowship of the Ring concludes at one point and right before- In fairness, Fellowship of the Ring is based on a separate book. Uh, it's, it's, it's its own book. Um, any- any type of cutting off in Lord of the Rings is fully on, well, Tolkien. They start the next point. That's when the movie stops, right? It stops after Boromir is killed, and they're about to enter into the jagged wasteland, and they're about to meet Gollum, right? What would have been weird in Fellowship is if Frodo and Sam had left the riverbank, gone up, and met Gollum, and then as soon as they meet Gollum, that's when you stop the movie. That would be strange, right? That's what Dune does. I just want to point out that that editing was a disingenuous representation of what he's trying to explain. That's what Dune does. It would have been better to me if they're in the desert, he gets out, they're searching for the Fremen, but things are as desperate as they can be because his dad is dead and because Harkonnen has taken over the planet and that's sort of where things break. Instead, they break, I think, in the wrong place. My problem isn't the break. My problem is that the break is in the wrong place. All righty, we'll get to more on Dune. In okay, so so I, I, I'm not going to say that I disagree with that entirely. Um, arguably, it would be a cleaner break to make it there. Um, that being said, even though it arguably concludes with what many people would want to be the... Uh, well, frankly, the uh, the starting beat of the next story, it does finish that beat. It's not like it cuts right in the middle of that beat. It it ends with him encountering them, meeting with them, gaining their trust, and then it ends. So that beat actually is concluded. Now, the beat that it takes us to next is them on their journey, with the Fremen on their journey to take him back to to like the city. 
um, which is honestly acceptable. I don't really know if it's necessarily that big of an issue. Um, it didn't bother me. It's one of those things where like, because it does complete its own smaller beat. Like I can understand what he's talking about is in terms of the larger picture of it. But I, I do think that there is some merit to having it end with him encountering the Fremen. I think there is some merit to it. Um, maybe not as clean as if it had just ended with them fleeing into the desert. I guess that's an argument you could make. But I think they both are... I think it's fine. To be fair, I can't actually tell how big of an issue this is to him uh, just from the way he's talking about it. As for the feel of the film, it really does mirror the books. The book is cold sci-fi. There are some sci-fi books that are that are very warm and and you really feel a lot for the characters. Fahrenheit 451 is one that comes to mind. This is not a book like that. It's very long. It's kind of tech. You know, I don't actually know if I would have... It's been a while for me since I got into Fahrenheit 451, but I actually don't know if that would have occurred to me as a way to describe it, unless it's making a fire joke. Wait, was there a rim shot I missed? warm and and you really feel a lot for the characters fahrenheit 451 is one that comes to mind this is not a book like that it's there's a very quiet rim shot i did miss it he is just making a fire joke god damn it that it's very long it's kind of technical it's notoriously hard to adapt because it's so sprawling and it covers so much ground and it covers so much time but you know because villeneuve is kind of a cold director it works it does work really really well so i will say that every time the shy halud which is this giant sandworm uh, approaches the graphics are just astonishingly good when it travels through the dunes it's super cool because it's traveling through the dunes in the way that you know a missile would travel through waves that's what it looks like it's really neat looking i think the movie is actually great i think it's gonna be hard to adjudicate whether the movie is is great actually until you get a second part because you don't know what the conclusion of the movie looks like it could be a complete disaster area in which case the first half is great and the second half sucks but if this completes in the way that the first half is done i think it's going to be one of the great sci-fi epics of all time I will say, I feel pretty secure in his hands. Like as a director, when you're a moviegoer, there are certain directors where you just feel good walking into the theater because you know you're going to get something that is at least going to be really fascinating. And Villeneuve is one of those directors, right? To me, Nolan is the key director who's like that, but Villeneuve is clearly like that too. And he's really made his mark here. So I'm really excited, frankly, to see the second movie. I will say that I think it was such a bad release strategy to release it simultaneously on HBO Max. This is a big kind of industry insider thing right now is whether you should have simultaneous release of these films on a streaming platform as well as in the theaters. This is not a movie you should be watching on your tiny little cell phone. You should really be seeing this on an IMAX theater because the visuals are just spectacular. So the movie made 40 million domestic, 220 worldwide. This movie certainly would have opened at 80, 90 million bucks if this were not available on streaming. This would have been a massive opening. I think Hollywood is going to pretty quickly move away from the simultaneous streaming release with the theater. As far as I'm aware, the only people still doing it are uh, Peacock. So I think the theaters are going to come back and come back in a pretty strong way. If they don't, it's going to be hard to get movies like this made. So my recommendation, go check this out in a theater. It's a huge movie. It looks beautiful. It's definitely worth the watch. Or maybe wait until part two comes out and then watch them back to back in a theater, which is definitely something that I would do. All righty, if you enjoyed our review, I did not. I found it unoffensive, which in this situation is honestly not what I'm hoping for. I will say I do think it's interesting that he never, that he, he doesn't really touch on subtext at all. Um, he briefly mentions that he thinks the Harkonnens are Soviets, but that's as close as he ever gets to mentioning any type of subtext to the film, um, which is makes sense because the subtext of the film is you can't trust religion or and you can't trust, uh, according to Frank Herbert, the whole point is you can't trust charismatic leaders. So Frank Herbert would say you can't trust Trump. You can't trust Elon Musk. If anything, the thing Biden has going for him is how fucking boring he is. Well, folks, I just saw Dune 2. I have many thoughts. This video is sponsored by PDS Death. Let's see. Does he, will he finally, will he finally get into subtext? Will he begin to acknowledge what the major themes and basic building blocks of the movie are? Honestly, if you skip to part 
if you just skip to his reaction to my reaction to his part two, I will not blame. I won't blame you at all. Although I guess I should put that message at the beginning of the uh, the recording. Okay, let's begin with the fact that Dune 1 and Dune 2, which encompasses the whole of the original Frank Herbert Dune, these two movies constitute the single greatest science fiction epic movie achievement of all time. It looks absolutely phenomenal. The acting is top notch. The score is great. It has probably the best visual effects ever. Finally, he admits the score is great. That son of a bitch. I've ever seen on film because you don't sense the CGI. Normally when you have this much CGI, you really sense it a lot. Here you really do not sense the CGI. You're on multiple planets throughout Dune 2. And they all have different color schemes, different color palettes and different looks. And it's really pretty phenomenal. So let's start from the beginning. Spoiler alert, there are gonna be lots of spoilers. So Dune part one ended with Paul Atreides heading off into the desert. The Harkonnens have killed his father. He and his mom, who is a member of the Bene Gesserit, they end up going off into the desert to accompany the Fremen. And this is all the predicate to Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides becoming the prophet foretold by both Bene Gesserit lore and, as it turns out, the lore created for the Fremen by the Bene Gesserit. So in the Fremen... Ben, that's just Bene Gesserit. That's, that's, that means it's just Bene Gesserit. Ah, uh, I feel like he's gonna miss the point. In lore, there's supposed to be this figure called the Lisan al-Gaib. And the Lisan al-Gaib is supposed to be a figure who is going to make the planet bloom again, apparently sometime in the distant past. It actually was a blooming paradise, and now it's all just a, a desert planet. In the Bene Gesserit lore, there's something called the Kwisatz Hadrach, which is supposed to be, again, a foretold prophet who's going to come and, and rule over all of the known universe in the ways that the Bene Gesserit would like. That's the basic religious plot line here. So when we start movie two, Paul Atreides is with the Fremen. It's unclear whether he and his mom are gonna be accepted by the Fremen, but the movie actually opens in a different place, which is really smart. Now you see the same sort of thing in the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Return of the King. By Return of the King, the movie opens with this sort of backstory about Smeagol, and the idea is to set you in the universe again. Well, the same thing happens here. Here, you have Florence Pugh's Princess Irulan. I actually hated that part of Return of the King. I'm sorry. Um... I have a lot of issues with Return of the King. I have a lot of unpopular opinions about Return of the King. That seems not terrible. It... I'm sorry, I came off way harsh there. I didn't hate it. I just have issues with it. I would have to rewatch. I need to rewatch The Lord of the Rings. I don't know when I'll do that uh, because if I rewatch them, I'd probably want to rewatch. I'd probably want to watch the extended cuts because I've never seen them and see how I feel about the movies afterwards. But uh, it was actually a series where my enthusiasm diminished after each film a little bit. I love the first movie. Actually, I like. Actually, really enjoyed the second movie. I never. I, and uh, the third movie, I was just like, "How are they still on this one fucking mountain?" Like the two towers actually does end at a weird place, and then they and then it's almost like the reverse of what Ben complained about with the first Dune movie, where like. We then spend so much of the third movie doing a thing that I'm pretty confident was mostly concluded in the second book. Uh, very annoying. Like I said, I need to rewatch it. It's been a long time. This isn't supposed to be about Lord of the Rings, damn it. Who is reading from her diary, explaining what just happened in the last movie for those who missed it. So the idea was going to be that the Emperor was afraid of the Atreides family. And so he gave the ability to the Harkonnen family to kill off all of the Atreides. But and they missed Lady Jessica and they missed Paul Atreides. And now Paul Atreides is, is running around and making trouble for the Harkonnen family and by proxy for the emperor. Fuck your ads, Ben. The, the first half of the movie, maybe the first third of the movie is dedicated to Paul becoming Fremen to being accepted as a Fremen, to learning the ways of the Fremen and stances with wolves. He, he's, he's becoming fully engaged in the Fremen culture, everything from how to properly sandwalk to how to ride a sandworm. He's not a Mary Sue, right? He's, he's been trained in actual combat by the top commanders. In I feel like Mar the term Mary Sue is, is one of those terms that is now becoming just a buzzword where we're getting a little bit too obsessed with it. Like Ben felt it was very important that people understand that Paul Atreides isn't a Mary Sue in his civilization. And then he goes and he learns combat from the Fremen also. But also he makes not stupid decisions. So he gets to the end of the film and he's in love with Shani, but he doesn't stay with Shani. He understands that his only shot at being Kwisatz Haderach is to marry the daughter of the emperor. Paul actually understands this. 
Whoa, Ben. Whoa. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. That's a lot to unpack already. First of all, Ben does not understand Dune because he thinks it's good for Paul Atreides to do this, which means that Ben unironically thinks the prophecy is real, uh, which is not the point. The point is that the prophecy is a manipulation. The movie does, not to be fair, the, uh, the movie does a good job of like balancing the perspectives on like between the people who are clearly manipulating the situation. Like, that's the thing is we see his mother's politics. Like, this is a manipulation. This prophecy is not even originally part of the Fremen's religion. Like, that's the fucked up thing. And also, he doesn't even want to do this. Like, Ben just skipped over a huge part of the movie where he does not want to be the Messiah. I'm going to say Messiah because it's easier to say than those other fucking made up dune words. He he doesn't want that. So like like a good portion of the movie is about how he does not want to be that person. The strategy, and he understands that his political ambitions are going to have to come before Shani. Okay, so they, they get taken in. The Fremen decide that... The thing is, is that... The thing is, is that him marrying that chick is more of a political decision, and he understands that he benefits from that. But I don't think he's actually trying... To, like, this implies that he is leaving Chani. Ben, I don't think that you understand royalty. Like, his best case scenario is he marries this chick for political reasons and keeps banging Chani. Like, it's Chani at the end of the movie who's like, uh-uh, I'm sticking to my beliefs, I'm sticking to my guns, I know that this is all bullshit and I'm pissed at you for, for going along with it. Like, Chani is definitely taken aback by that moment. It is definitely jealous. But in all honesty, I don't think that I don't think the marriage is the main reason she leaves. She leaves because he is choosing power over her. Now, she doesn't realize that he has this mentality of absolute survival. And this, this is what he believes he needs to do to survive. Oh, but <sighs> Lady Jessica is going to become the reverend mother of their tribe, which really helps a lot since it allows her to spread the propaganda that her son is, in fact, the long awaited one. Meanwhile, Ben, do you understand how why that's important thematically? Paul Atreides is really split internally as to whether he should take up the mantle of Huysats Hadarach or whether he should basically just fight alongside the Fremen. The reason for this is because he's been having all these visions and he sees that if he becomes. OK, Ben, I apologize. You were covering this part. You just for some reason did it non-chronologically. The leader, if he becomes the Kwisatz Haderach, or- It's still fucking weird, his representation of Messiah figures, though. Or if he becomes the Lisan al-Gaib, that he is going to cause untold suffering. The, there's one performance in the movie that the movie really relies on in a heavy way, and that is Fade Rautha. Fade Rautha is the Harkonnen nephew who is supposed to be the big baddie in this movie. So the second part- I feel like we skipped over a period there somewhere of the film is the introduction of the big baddie and then the third part of the film is the culmination of the battle i only have a couple of problems in terms of the film christopher walken as the emperor is weird and takes you out of it it's like oh hey, i'm the emperor and they go, what are you doing here we couldn't i just want to say like this has more to do what he's describing right now with christopher walken actually has much more to do with our with the way people perceive Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken's performance is actually very subtle and toned down from what you would normally expect from Christopher Walken. Like he honestly barely speaks a lot of the film. Like he is he's often seen more than he has heard. Um, at least if you percentage his total screen time. Uh, but like, I think this is unfair. I think that Christopher Walken, I understand why people have been pointing out Christopher Walken's performance, but honestly, I didn't like he's it's it's not like he's walking in here doing his most Christopher Walkeny thing. Like he's he doesn't do anything stereotypically Christopher Walkeny. He just he's just talking people. And found like anyone else old in Hollywood, like literally no one. Aside from that, the only other problem with the film is that when you finally get to the final battle, it's so unbelievably easy for Paul Atreides and his forces to just wipe out the Emperor and all of the Harkonnen forces. 
I mean, honestly, they had some pretty big advantages. They dropped a nuclear missile on their airfield, and then, uh, and then instead of just coming in on foot, they came in on giant fucking sandworms, uh, and basically took out all. Of, they basically destroyed all of their opponents, most of their opponents' artillery and stuff. Like, the battle also goes on for a very long time. Like, it starts during the day, and we still see fighting at night. You wonder why they didn't do it earlier. And this is actually projected earlier on in the film. And you see Paul, who's spending an awful lot of time with the Fremen, attacking various spice machines. And I just kept thinking to myself, the attacking weaponry is so much better than the defending weaponry that I don't even understand why this war is is a competition. So the, the ease with which the last battle... I don't know if I agree with that entirely. ...battle is fought makes it somewhat anticlimactic. Most, most of the combat is swords on swords. Like most of the combat is literally sword on sword combat. So I don't necessarily know if I agree with this complaint. And so you're wondering, how did the Harkonnens take over this entire planet? You know, put, put aside that particular qualm, the movie looks spectacular. Now, because they're trying to play up the conflict within Paul Atreides about whether to become this prophetic figure or not. That is turned into a broader conversation about whether religion is itself a myth or whether religion is... Could it be about to get interesting? ...is a manipulative tool or whether religion is a reality. Okay, other political things, there's one political thing that they don't even know that they're doing, which this happens a lot to Denny Villanueva. His movies turn out to be shockingly pro-life. In this movie, because Lady Jessica is pregnant, Lady Jessica is talking to the fetus the entire movie. They show the baby in... What? 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 First of all, I assume whatever is, I, I haven't read the book, so I assume this is some basis in the book, but it's worth noting the entire reason she can talk to the fetus is because both her and the fetus's brains were massively, like the fetus's brain was exposed to the same drug that like imparts the suffering and pain of a thousand of like millions of women across millions of lives all into one person. And so like that fetus is much more than a fetus, Ben. <laughs> also, you know, she could just be tripping. She could just be fucked in the brain from taking the drug. Um, but like the feet, Ben sees what he wants to see. In utero? Like that is- Like, like Evil Dead is a pro-life movie. Like a clearly anti-abortion film. This is just weird sci-fi stuff, Ben. It's not a cluster of cells. That is an actual character in the film. In any The baby is much further along than being just a cluster of cells, also. He's being disingenuous in that comparison. In any case, everything is being set up for part three. And apparently there's gonna be not like a two to three year delay between this movie and the next movie. So it's very much like like Lord of the Rings. They're gonna wait to see how this one does. It's going to make all the money. The best thing about Denis Villeneuve or Christopher Nolan, the best working directors today, is that they put on the screen all the money. So this film cost about $190 million to make, and every dollar of it is on the screen. And this movie demands to be seen in IMAX. You need the rumbling of the ships. You need the big sounds. You need the deafening sound of the, th the thopters. You need, you need like all of the elements of the film. As, as a piece of world building, it, it's the best world building that I've seen since Lord of the Rings. The acting is universally good. You know, I had a lot of critiques of Timothy Chalamet in, in Dune 1. They're alleviated somewhat in this. Again, I think that the biggest problem with Timothy Chalamet- I don't remember him saying any of those in his review. We just, wa we just watched it, right? Did he say anything about Timothy Chalamet? Well, I'll know in the editing. Chalamet is he's just very skinny. <laughs> I mean, it's weird to say that, but if he's- Ben. Ben. You shouldn't be throwing rocks in that glass house there. He's supposed to be this kind of prophetic, fiery figure. Then him being this incredible fighter and weighing maybe 92 pounds soaking wet is uh, is is sort of a, a strange thing. But first of all, Ben, he looks at least 120 pounds. Second of all, second of all, Ben, I mean, did you see their fighting style? It kind of makes sense. They like f roll and tumble and flip over people and stab them with knives. Does he play it? Well, yeah, I think he upped his game for, for Dune part two. Overall, five out of five stars, really good movie, really interesting movie. And again, if they don't end up making a part three, it will live on its own as, as a fulsome film experience. Interesting.
interesting. Okay. Okay. So that was interesting. Um, at least at the end there. Uh, very interesting there at the end. So, I mean, it was kind of exactly what I predicted. Ben Shapiro only briefly touches on the actual theme. Like, it was actually interesting what happened because he he brought up the themes of like it questioning and 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 drawing sort of this type of uncertainty towards religion. And the thing is that that is absolutely what Frank Herbert was doing because Frank Herbert's novels are meant to be anti-authoritarian. He is critique, it is, he is deconstructing the white savior myth and how it is perpetuated via our culture onto other cultures and how the use of these religions are used to control and motivate people towards violence. Like Ben didn't talk about any of that. Instead, he briefly brings up how it questions religion and and he and of course he has to throw out the not to be fair, I throw out this in my review as well, the like the balance of is it real? Is it not? But like having read some comments by Frank Herbert, I, I'm I'm pretty confident in between my review and now, I'm I'm pretty confident that 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 it's that there there is no prophecy, that the prophecy is bullshit and they made it up. I mean, why else would they be curating numerous F, numerous lines genetically to find this messiah figure um akin to uh the da vinci code and the uh the descendants of christ uh because that's essentially what's happening in the movie by the way um ben didn't really touch on any of that maybe because it's part of the criticism of religion and dune a hundred percent is a criticism of religion but ben is not going to address that instead he's going to briefly bring it up and then segue it to politics that he actually says he doesn't think are intentional. Like he said, and I'll correct myself in the editing if I'm wrong, I, but I believe he commented that he didn't think Dennis, Dennis was doing it on purpose to be pro-life. Also, like I can see how he would interpret that as pro-life. And I don't know what Frank Herbert's opinions on pro-life versus pro-choice are, especially since those politics used to be nonpartisan and only became partisan when Ronald Reagan decided to turn abortion into a wedge issue. But he used that point to try and pivot the movie's politics back around to his own because he wants to have a positive opinion of this movie and he wants you to have a positive opinion of this movie. And if you're one of his watchers, you probably are conservative. So he's going to want to subvert the fact that the film has very subversive themes and storytelling moments about religion and power itself to bring it back around to babies matter. Like that's, I think that's very interesting and telling of, of where of where Ben is in his mind and the world. All right. Well, that was kind of interesting. Hope you enjoy, hope you uh, got some entertainment out of it. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, please like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or follow on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you for tuning in. Have a wonderful whatever, wherever, however, whoever you are.